1 Samuel chapter 12. And Samuel said unto all Israel, Behold, I have hearkened unto your voice, and all that ye said unto me, and have made a king over you. Now it's their request. They wanted the king. I know God brought Saul, but God would never brought Saul if they didn't say, hey, we want a king. So later on when you see, when you say, well, Saul was the people's choice and David was God's choice. It's the fact is that they requested to have a king. And now behold the king, there he is, Saul, walking before you. And I am old and gray headed. And behold, my sons are with you. Chapter 8, verse 3. About his sons. Chapter 8, verse 3. And his sons walked not in his way, but turned aside after lucre, and took bribes, and perverted judgment. I don't know why he mentioned them. They're not doing right. But he said, here's my sons. And I have walked before you from my childhood, there's one only one other place in the Bible with that, and that's Ecclesiastes chapter eleven, verse ten. Only two places, childhood. Unto this day, chapter one, verse twenty-four. Chapter one, verse twenty-four. Because I've been since childhood. And when she had weaned him, she took him up with her, three to bullocks one ephah of flour and a bottle of wine and brought him into the house of the Lord in Shiloh and the child was young. So Samuel has been at that tabernacle before Eli since the day he's been weaned. From off his mother's breast carrying him to the tabernacle having him walk he's been there with God. So we learn that. Behold, here I am. Witness against, here I am. Witness against me before the Lord and before his anointed. That's Saul. Been anointed. Twice. Whose ox have I taken? Have I been a thief? Or whom have I defrauded? That's the first time that word shows up. When have I come? When I have I oppressed? Or of whose hand have I received any bribe? That's the first time that word shows up. His sons were to blind my eyes therewith. A, a bribe will blind your eyes to judgment. All right, I'll take the money, and I don't care who's innocent or guilty. Whatever you want, the money will buy it. And I will restore it to you. And they said, Thou hast not defrauded us, nor oppressed us, neither hast thou taken aught of any man's hand. 1 Timothy 3 7. 1 Timothy 3 7. Talk about a man in the ministry. First Timothy three seven. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without. Without what? Without the church. Now the people of Israel are testifying to Samuel. Hey, you're good. You're right. Third John twelve. Third John twelve. And if you're going to go into ministry, you've got to have this good report. And there are other places in the Bible about this good report, but I just went to these. 3 John, verse 12. I almost said chapter 12. 1 John, 3 uh, John, I'm getting myself. 3 John 12. Demetrius has a good report of all men. These are men in the ministry. They don't defraud. They don't rob. They don't steal. They don't lie. They're valuable men. And if they were to be brought up in a courtroom 
like Jesus was with a man of good report. They will have to lie about him in order to get a guilty plea. And that is to be our conduct as we are serving the Lord in this world. We must have a good report. We must stand firm. And as Samuel said, have I taken anything? You are not to take anything of anybody by theft. You are not to defraud anybody. You are not to oppress. You have to take bribes. And they said, Thou hast not defrauded us, nor oppressed us, neither hast thou taken aught of any man's hand. And he said unto them, The Lord is witness against you. And his anointed is witness this day, that ye have not found aught in my hand. Now what Samuel is saying, there's a witness between God, there's a witness between you, there's a witness between Saul, and there's a witness between me. It is not me that said for you to call for a king. You have not left God because of what Samuel has done. You have not turned to God and said, you know, that prophet of yours, that preacher of yours, Lord, you know, that's it. I'm giving up. I'm, I'm going to do something else because of that man that stands, that man who, who's in charge. That is not the case with Samuel. And there have been people who have left serving God because the man behind the pulpit has oppressed. He has defrauded. And that's not right. But if a man leads the Lord and the man of God, the preacher, here, Samuel, is doing right. And there's no wrong. And the people say, yeah, he's good report. And they answered, he is witness. Now that he is God. They are saying that Samuel is, is a good report that God, we are witness to the fact is we asked for him. And Samuel had no say or no particular part that we are abandoning you, rebelling against you. Now again, we're going to see verse 6 all the way down to 15. We're going to see Jewish Israel history again. And I don't know if Samuel's reading from a book or if he's quoting it from his head, but history, history, history keeps coming up. And today, uh, to show my wife, she likes that Laura Ingalls. They are mad with Laura Ingalls because she wrote something about a period of time that happened. So they want to erase all that from history. They want to get rid of all the names that offended them. Well, if you don't know what history has, history will beat itself. If one thing man learns from history, he doesn't learn from history. Now Samuel is going to run through the history again. And Samuel said unto the people, It is the Lord that advanced Moses and Aaron. Now, what's he saying? Now, we today don't need to go there, but when we read Psalm 75 as a family today, Psalm 75, verse 6, For promotion cometh neither from the east, nor from the west, nor from the south, but God. God gives the promotion. What is he scolding Israel about? If God wanted a human king, he had no problem choosing Moses. He had no problem choosing Aaron. If he wanted a leader over the nation, he would have found that man. So Samuel is saying to Israel, this is Samuel speaking, I did not lead you to ask for the king. Right? I did good, right? Good report. Yes, sir, you did good report. If there was to be a king in Israel, God would have called somebody. Did he not call Moses and Aaron? Yeah, he called Moses and Aaron. Has he called for a king? No. That's your doing. And that brought your fathers up out of the land of Egypt. If you need a leader, God will give you one. They have a leader. They have a good leader. Samuel. He's a judge. And they just acknowledge. He's a good judge. He's a faithful judge. 
But we want to be like other nations. We don't want a judge. We want a king. Now, therefore, stand still, that I may reason with you before the Lord of all the righteous acts of the Lord, which he did to you and to your father. Now, history. What does Samuel call the history of the Jews? The righteous acts. Everything that God has done has been righteous. What you guys are doing is not righteous. When Jacob was come into Egypt, Genesis, end of Genesis, and your fathers cried unto the Lord, then the Lord sent Moses, Exodus, and Aaron, which brought forth your fathers out of Egypt and made them dwell in this place. Look at the, look, look at the, the, the uh, we're going right from Egypt right into the promised land. Condensed. Very short. And when they forgot the Lord, forgot the Lord, their God, he sold them into the hand of Sisera, judges, captain of the host of Hazor, into the hand of the Philistines, judges, into the hand of the king of Moab, and they fought against him. And they cried unto the Lord and said, We have sinned, because we have forsaken the Lord, and have served Balaam and Ashtoreth. Now look at the history he's recalling. He's recording the history of the children of Israel when they defiled God and went against God, as they're doing now. Balaam and Ashtoreth, judges, but now deliver us out of the hand of our enemies, and we will serve thee. And the Lord said, Jeroboam, Judges 6, and Bedan, and Jetheth, Judges 11, and Samuel. God sent me. Samuel's a judge. People, you had a leader. Me. How did I defraud you? You didn't defraud. Me. How did God defraud you? Samuel, and deliver you out of the hand of your enemy. On every side and he dwell safe so what's the problem and when he saw that Nahash the king of the children Amon came against you chapter 11 first Samuel and you said unto me nay but a king shall reign over us when the Lord your God was your king theocracy when a God and priests are in charge of the government that's where they say church and state The people sin when they ask for a ruler, a king. You want to be a Christian nation, you, you don't have a president. Now therefore, behold, the king whom ye have chosen. He say God set him up. God only set him up because that was their request. If there was no request for a king, there would be no Saul. King. He would be back looking for his asses. He'd be back in his father's house tending to his asses. He would not have been anointed. He would be there would be no leader but God. And when Nahash came, they would not turn to Saul, they would turn to God. And whom ye desired, we want a king. And behold, the Lord has set a king over you. Monarchy. Monarchy. If conditional, that's free will. If you don't have to, you may not. God gives a free will. If in the Bible it violates the teaching of Calvinism, if it was Calvinism, it would say you will, but it doesn't. If Ye will fear the Lord and serve him, conditional, and obey his voice and not rebel against the commandment of the Lord. Then shall both ye and also the king that reigneth over you continuing, continue following the Lord your God. Then you know it doesn't happen. But if ye will not obey the Lord, 
conditional. Yea, verse 14, nay, verse 15. But rebel against the commandment of the Lord. Then shall the hand of the Lord be against you, as it was against your fathers. Okay, now. Now, therefore stand, they're already standing, verse 7. And see this great thing, which the Lord will do before your eyes. Jews require a sign. Is it not wheat harvest today? That's interesting. Because that now dates where we're at. We are at Pentecost. Ruth chapter 2, 23. To show us where Ruth is. Now, it's not going to tell us the year, but Ruth 2, 23. It could show us the months. Now I got something to read. Ruth 2.23 So she kept fast by the maidens of Boaz and gleaned unto the end of barley harvest and of wheat harvest and dwelt with her mother-in-law. Barley harvest comes first, then the wheat harvest. So, Pesach or Passover which marked the beginning of the barley harvest. The Passover is when Ruth chapter 2. The practice was to cut the first sheaves of barley the day before Pesach or Passover and to bring an offering from the early harvest on the second day of the festival, the seven days, until this, until this was brought, it was forbidden to eat from this new crop. All right, so now the correct time to cut wheat is 50 days after the barley is ripe. 50 days after the Passover is Pentecost. Therefore, it was natural to count seven weeks of seven days. Where have I heard that before? 49 days from the time of barley harvest to the wheat harvest. And they call this the counting of the Omar. With Shavuot, I'm not saying that wrong, past uh, Pentecost arrival, the weather stabilizes and the wheat harvest begins con consequently uh, the names of Hag Hekizer, Reaping Festival, Hag Hebekurum, saying it wrong, holiday of the first fruits. So we are at, if it's the day of harvest of wheat, we are in the Pentecost season. Now, I will call unto the Lord, and he shall send thunder and rain, that ye may perceive and see that your wickedness is great, which you have done in the sight of the Lord, in asking, that's the first time that shows up, for a king. Now for me, Sam is, I'm going to ask for a thunderstorm, but yeah, all right, cool. Let it come. But this is not the time of thunder and rain. God has organized and established proper season. And you can look them up online. It's very interesting. There is no rain. There is no thunder in this time of Pentecost or the wheat harvest at all. So what Samuel's doing to sign is, I'm going to cause something to happen that will never happen. It has not ever happened. It's a sign. It's like Elijah calling down fire upon that offering. So Samuel called unto the Lord, and the Lord sent thunder and rain that day. And all the people greatly feared the Lord and said, Why? It has never rained and thundered on heat. This is not the time. I guess God is angry with us. I guess Samuel is right. It's a sign. So Samuel called unto the Lord, and the Lord sent thunder and rain that day. That day. Probably Pentecost, if not there around. And all the people greatly feared the Lord and Samuel. And all the people said unto Samuel, Pray for thy servants unto the Lord thy God, that we die not. This is so unusual. God's going to kill us. 
Now it says thunder and light. I mean, it says thunder and rain. There's no lightning. Thunder's not going to kill you. The crop or the harvest yep. will mold and they'll starve. Yeah. Also, another place in the Bible says that God thundered upon them and they died. Their crop can be ruined. Who knows what this thunder is going to do with the history that has already been told? They now realize they're in trouble. Pray unto that sir. Like I said, my wife said. There's damage of the crops. Evolution it, you know, had all the conditions right. To, to do it. I don't believe it. This is God's land. God knows what the crops need and what the crops don't need. They don't need rain. Pray for thy servant, the Lord thy God, that we die not. For we have added unto all our sins this evil to ask us a king. God was to be their leader. And Samuel said unto the people, Fear not. Ye have done all this wickedness. What's the wickedness? Asking for a king. Taking their reliance off of God and putting it on a man. Yet turn not aside from following the Lord, but serve the Lord with all thy heart. And turn ye not aside, for then shall ye go after vain things which cannot profit nor deliver, for they are vain. You don't serve God, you're going to serve something that's worthless. For the Lord will not forsake his people for his great namesake. Now you got that? There are people who say God's all finished with the Jew. Uh-uh. According to the Bible, God says that Jew is all... Now God may send some off into hell. God may uh, discipline some of them. When God's angry with them, as a father, he's going to scold his children. But he's not ever done with them. For his great name's sake. As long as God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, those are his people. Because it has pleased the Lord to make you his people. Moreover, as for me, Samuel, God forbid that I should sin against the Lord. And ceasing, that's the first time that word is mentioned, to pray for you. All right? Ask your pastor if he prays for you. I don't know. Hey, pastor, when's the last time you prayed for my family or me? Because the Bible records it's a sin for a leader of the people not to pray for them. It's a sin for us Christians if we don't pray for other Christians. It says right there, I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you. If you stop praying for somebody, if you don't pray for anybody, that's a sin. But I will teach you the good and the right way. That's what a pastor is supposed to do. to pray for his congregation and he's to show them the good and the right way now will you follow that's an if only fear the lord and serve him in truth with all your heart for consider how great things he has done for you i wonder if it's still raining but if he shall but if ye shall still do wickedly, free will, the choice is, ye shall be consumed, both ye and your king. And he is. And it looks like, uh, Saul is kind of weird. The statements that are made, we'll talk about that later when we get there, but under the law, he goes to hell. 